Welcome to the Private Practice Journeys podcast, where mental health professionals learn about the nuts and bolts of private practice by listening to the journeys of four therapists that have taken the plunge into private practice. And here's your host, Chris Corto. Hey everyone, this is Chris Quarto, and welcome again to Private Practice Journeys. Well, at the time of this recording, I have had a slew of people who have joined the Private Practice Journeys Facebook community. Thank you. If you've never had the opportunity to listen to a Private Practice Journeys podcast episode, let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing here. Um, I asked four therapists if they would be willing to be interviewed by me on a monthly basis throughout 2017. Three of these therapists have just taken the plunge into private practice at the beginning of the year, and one of them has been in private practice for many years, but she's transitioning from solo to group practice. So the idea is for you, the listener, to listen to these episodes and and learn from these therapists. What's it like to go into private practice? What are some of the challenges? What are the nuts and bolts of developing your practice? And we, we talk about a lot of different issues um, as, as we go along from month to month. So it's a really cool concept that we have here. Now, over the past couple of weeks, I've invited some experts in private practice development to do what amounts to on-air consultations with uh, these therapists. So I've had uh, Joe Sanak on, I've had Allison Purrier on to talk to um, a couple of the therapists about what they're doing and what they can do to enhance and further develop their practices. So it's been a really cool deal. Now I have two other experts that are going to come on uh, in a in a couple of weeks, but this podcast episode today, I'm just interviewing an expert in private practice development, John Clark. Um, I don't have a therapist on with him to do anything. I just thought I'd pick his brain just to find out what his thoughts are about helping people develop their practices. So um, listen in. I think you'll really like this episode. And uh, the other experts will have on the following weeks to do their on-air consultations with the remaining two therapists. So I hope you like today's episode. Hey everyone, welcome back to Private Practice Journeys, and this is another special episode. Uh, and in this case, I have John Clark joining me, and uh, he's a licensed professional counselor in Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, John, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Hey, it was nice that we were able to link up with one another. Um, this is a really cool thing because uh, I've been having guest experts come on to the uh, podcast here a couple times now and just having our um, four therapists talk to them. Uh, in, in this case, I wanted to have you come on just so I could talk to you alone about um, a little bit about what you do, your, your private practice, and also a little bit about the, uh, the privatepracticeworkshop.com as well. And I thought that this would be a good time for us to talk to one another. So why don't we start off, uh, John, if you could just say a little bit more about who you are or what you do for a living. Absolutely, yeah. And I think it's, it's so I, – I love – connecting with other people who do consulting with therapists starting a practice because I think there's a bunch of us out there right now yeah. and um, it's a it's a good thing because therapists really have their pick in terms of who they choose to work with this or is what is the style of the consultant so I think it's kind of neat but also to me it reflects that there's so many different ways of doing things in terms of launching a practice growing it taking a marketing perspective um, so that that's kind of neat um, I, I got into this because I, uh, I launched my first practice in San Francisco, which is, um, as you know, a really competitive market and a yeah. really tough place to grow a practice. And sure. um, it relied a lot on me individuating myself and um, creating a re pretty narrow niche. Um, and I did that and I learned a lot of things the hard way and um, eventually found some systems that started working well for me. And what I fall back on a lot is, is using the internet to promote one's practice okay. in a place like San Francisco, it was super important because it's such a technology driven area. So I, I, um, learned a lot of things in launching that practice. And then I just kind of found that all of my friends were picking my brain and, and ah. trying to get, <laughs> trying to get some help with their practices. And I did that enough to where I eventually said, 
all right, I need to just start writing this stuff down, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and I'm not even making money off of it yet. I just need to write it down somewhere because yeah. I'm saying the same things every time, especially when people are in those beginning stages where they have nothing or yeah. maybe they have an office but don't know how to get clients. Um, so that's when I started the blog and started privatepracticeworkshop.com as just a place, somewhere to put it all. Right. Um, and then I started working with therapists more formally in, in the consulting that I do. So that, that's kind of how I came to it. And then I learned, um, I had to put my own systems to the test when I moved to Charlotte this past summer and started Charlotte Counseling and Wellness, which has grown into a group practice, um, since I launched it, uh, in, October or so. Yeah. So that's grown quickly, but, um, yeah, I've had to take those lessons that I learned and really try them out again here in Charlotte and see if they would work in this market. Um, so I, I just continue to learn every day and I, I love it. Yeah. You sound like uh, a little bit about, uh, I was talking to Alison Perrier about, uh, her experiences, uh, as well. And she had the similar where she had moved from the West coast to, well, I think to your, I think in North Carolina. She's maybe. in Asheville. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was actually on her uh, podcast yesterday oh, talking about this very okay. thing about yeah. starting in a new place. So, um, yeah, that'll be coming out soon. And I think it's, it's a novel situation to be in, um, when you move to a new place and you know, zero people. Um, and you also don't necessarily know what works in this particular community in terms of getting clients. So that's, it, it just it takes it some time on top of the personal transition of coming to a new place. Yeah, and I want to I want to yeah. talk about that. I want to talk about private practice workshop in a sec, but I also want to talk a little bit more about this journey of yours from moving from San Francisco to Charlotte, and um, because that that's a big deal to have to you know, establish a new practice. And how do you go about doing that? And I, I bet a lot of the, the journey followers might have that same question. I mean, what was your process in, in doing that, John? Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. I, um, I, I got, I got a bit of a kickstart because number one, I, I brought my Yelp page with me from San Francisco and converted it to represent uh, Charlotte counseling and wellness, which okay. Um, I talked to Allison about this a little bit. Yelp is a really underutilized uh, resource for therapists, and it's a controversial one. But for me, it really helped get going here in Charlotte because so few therapists were using it. Yeah. Um, and it's a free resource. Um, and actually, a lot of some of the reviews that I have on there are are from colleagues or from people who I've said, "Hey, you know, you know a little bit about what I do. I'd love." you know, if you're able to, to leave a little review there, just speaking to what you know, that, sure. hey, I went to this CBT training with John. I think he's good at working with anxiety. He's good with young professionals and then take it from there. So that that helped. And then I would say even the name of my business, um, using some, some built-in keywords, Charlotte and Counseling, was another way to kind of get ahead a little bit uh, in terms of starting to think about SEO really early on. So um I'm always encouraging people to think about their web presence. And I think even if you're anticipating a move, you can start thinking about that web presence. You could build the website, start some blogging, yeah. start to plug in some keywords and have it start to grow organically because we know SEO takes time. You could do that six months before you're moving. Um, but I think what's important is just to have a plan, to, right. to start early and, and have a plan. Yeah. Sounds yeah. like um, part of this whole process of developing a practice involves – uh, not only planning, but perhaps having a strategy as well. And part of your strategy was to um, do a little bit about what you did in San Francisco and is to use the Internet to your advantage, uh, in particular the, the SEO, using those keywords and, and things of that nature. Um, and I wonder if uh, you, you had mentioned blogging as well, and maybe you could talk a little bit about that and how – Perhaps I'm not sure if that relates to privatepracticeworkshop.com or maybe you could talk a, a little bit about that now. Yeah, I think it's it's both really. So I, I use blogging in uh, a lot in privatepracticeworkshop.com just to offer great content to therapists, and then I use it as well for Charlotte Counseling and Wellness. Um, the the main thing is that you know Google needs to see that you're your website is still relevant, that it's still alive and, and a, a living, you know, entity. Um, and one way to do that is by continuing to push out new content, even if it's small, even if it's, you know, 300 words or ideally closer to 400 of just you talking about anxiety and maybe throwing in some keywords naturally there. 
Um, there's a lot of, I think, uh, you know, secondary gains from blogging, like demonstrating your expertise, yeah. just providing value, creating rapport with a potential client before they've even called you on the phone. So, um, yeah, I think it's it's just one of many ways to to kind of build the SEO of your site and also to start um, to start that rapport with with your potential clients. Yeah, clients. I think when they read that, they they learn about you, and I think that there is a comfort level that that comes along with that. And and I agree with that. And I and I think there is something to be said about even the general website about when you write your about page of your website and how you present yourself and what pictures do you put on there and do you put personal pictures on there and what pictures are appropriate and what aren't appropriate and there, that goes into that planning and strategy strategizing too doesn't it absolutely i i um, recently put a picture of me um, wearing workout clothes and sunglasses with my <laughs> with my dog uh, hiking in California. Oh, that's great! A few months ago, because actually I needed a good picture of her because she's in the office with me. Um, ah, okay. She's a therapy dog, yep. and so I couldn't find a better one. I thought, you know, I'm just going to try this. Right, this is me, not in a buttoned up shirt, not wearing nice clothes, and having this great headshot. It's just me, you know, yeah. in the woods with my dog, and. People like it, you know. Yeah. I think people see I'm a real person. Um, you're going to meet this cute dog, and this is what I look like, right? I exist outside of um, right. how you see me in therapy, and I'm always kind. Of, that's kind of part of what, what I'm always pushing with my personal kind of brand is just um, is just that I'm a real person, right? And I, I think I want to be known um, to some extent by my clients, and mm -hmm. I think people like that, and it's it's kind of a fresh look on. On psychotherapy. Yeah, you you mentioned uh, the therapy dog. I, I've been in personal counseling myself, and my counselor uh, happened to have a dog, and um, I found it to be very comforting. Uh, in times, uh, some of the sessions were were very difficult for me, mm -hmm. and I found the dog to be quite comforting. And I think that's a really neat neat thing that you're doing there. So. Well, so let's talk a little bit about the blogging and and also the two websites that you have. So in terms of blogging itself, um, you could certainly use that for to promote uh, your own practice and and what you're doing as a counselor. But I think that you're doing this in two ways, aren't you? That you have the Charlotte Counseling and Wellness website and then you have privatepracticeworkshop.com. So are you doing blogs on, in both places? I am, yeah. And the, the content from Charlotte Counseling and Wellness is for clients, right? So it's things like how to deal, three tips for dealing with social anxiety or mm -hmm. what is the spotlight effect, you know, when we feel like everyone must be looking at me or thinking I look weird. Um, it's really... Um, yeah, it's really consumer friendly and it speaks to the type of client that I work with. Um, and actually, you know, Joe Sanok talks a ton about um, uh, outsourcing. So I've just started to have someone help me with those blog posts for Charlotte Counseling Wellness because ah. I think it's so hard to keep up with it. And yes. when you start getting busy, yep. it's probably the first thing that falls by the wayside. And yet we have to keep telling Google, hey, look, my site is still relevant. <laughs> keep, keep, you know, keep me, yeah. keep me relevant. I'm here. here. I'm so, out here. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm getting a little help with that and it's, it's a tremendous relief. I actually have, um, a young lady who's a recent psychology, um, graduate and knows one of my mentors and I've just kind of helped her to kind of learn the language yeah. and learn to apply things that she thinks are interesting and that she connects with as a young person. So that, that's, that's kind of cool. But then everything I do for private practice workshop is coming directly from me. What would you say to a person, John, who, um, is in, similar position where um, they're, they're thinking to themselves, I either, I don't have enough time to do blogging. I know it's important. I know I should be doing it, but you know, I just don't have time to do this. But on the other hand, I'm not sure I want somebody else to do the blogging because I want to have control over that. And so how do you deal with that kind of conflict? What would you recommend yeah. to people who have that kind of conflict? First of all, um, and I've been talking with folks a lot um, about this in, in the Facebook group, um, Private Practice Workshop Community. Um, how are we spending our time? Because the, I think a lot of us struggle with, 
a client cancels or you have that one hour in between clients and it, you, you just don't really know what to do with yeah. it. Um, and you end up checking Facebook for half an hour and then you've got to, <laughs> you realize for me, it's, I've got to take my dog out and then it's too late for that, for that. And, um, we just, that hour can kind of be wasted. I don't necessarily, I did, I don't feel better. I didn't really rest, yeah. but I also didn't get anything done. Yep. And then I'm like, geez, what did I do right. <laughs> that hour? It's unbelievable. Yep. So I'm encouraging therapists to do a bit of a time study, you know, look at even just tomorrow or look at this week and your schedule and, and kind of like it, if you were to create a pie chart, how much of your time is going to clients? And then what are you doing to focus on the most important aspects of your business? And really for, for a lot of people, especially if you're private pay, it's how are you, what are you doing to work on lead generation, you know, generating new, new leads for clients for your practice? Um, I think one really simple way to do it is just to go, all right, I'm going to work on lead generation for one hour a day. Okay. Um, and that might be the morning. I think for a lot of people it works better if you can do it before the day gets crazy. But that could be a number of different things. It could be blogging. It could be printed materials. It could be networking, getting coffee with someone. But okay. every, anything in that realm of lead generation, if you were to do it for one hour a day, even for a week, I, I, I can't see how that wouldn't pay off, right? Um, yes. you, you let me know what you think about that or how, maybe how you manage your own time. But I think it's something we struggle with, right? Because there's no yeah. one standing over your shoulder going, hey, hey, John, now you need to blog for a bit. Hey, now you need to, you know, order new printed materials or whatever. So, yeah. yeah. I found that uh, something very interesting. I, I read somewhere, I, it was on one of the Facebook communities where, um, and it didn't even have to do with blogging. It had to do with something else. But, it was somebody was talking about the, the, their iPhone that they found out, and I didn't even know this, that you could dictate in your iPhone and it would, you know, put, print it out on your on your computer for you. And I thought, man, that's kind of cool. You know, it's um, like one of those, what was it called, Dragon Naturally Speak programs where mm -hmm. they would do that kind of stuff. I thought, well, you know, I have an iPhone. I'm going to try this. So I like to take walks. And, uh, of course, when I take walks and maybe you do this too, John, is that you have a lot of time to think and a lot of yeah. really good stuff, private practice wise, or, you know, otherwise kind of pops in your head. But for me, oftentimes it's private practice wise. So I thought that this time when I take a walk, when stuff pops into my head, I'm just going to dictate it. And, um, I did, and I kept dictating and I kept dictating. And before I knew it, I had, I had a blog basically. And I thought, man, that was easy. There was That's really awesome. nothing to it. Yeah. And uh, so I think that just coming up with new and creative ways too uh, helps along those lines, doesn't it? I love that. I think that's an amazing way to do it. I actually just discovered um, that you can do the same thing with a MacBook. So if you're using a MacBook or a MacBook Pro, um, gosh, what is it? I think you, if you either double tap the FN button, the function button at the bottom left, you can dictate is that uh, as right? well. So even that is like little things like that go a long way. Yeah. Um, I also recently saw a, a, a video about um, – because more people are getting into video blogging and even just Facebook Live and stuff yeah. like that. And I think it's an amazing thing to do for your private practice. Um, it goes a long way. But people who hop on um, – and do a video, let's say you talk about anxiety, social anxiety for 10 minutes and you've got a general outline, but you're also just kind of riffing and yeah. maybe that you're, you're good at that. There's a service where you can get that transcribed for you for $1 per minute. So ah. that might, that's a $10, you know, blog post. They're going to type it up um, as, as close as they can. You're going to go in and edit it and then you've got a blog post and you can repurpose some of that content. Sure. And I thought that's what a great way to, to kind of double dip there. Talk, talk a little bit about repurposing, John, because uh, some of the journey followers might not be familiar with that, with that phrase. What is that referring to? <laughs> yeah, and that's something I'm kind of digging into a little bit more myself okay. because um, – First of all, there's a lot of the same content out there, I think, especially within the different private practice consultants. Like we all talk about how to set your fees or yeah. how to do that, that client phone call. Yeah. Um, and also, I'm, I'm, I might be, there might be an article that I wrote about how to set your fees, and that was a year and a half ago. 
Um, and I've got some different thoughts about it. So rather than start from scratch and write an entirely new article about um, setting your fees, I might take that article, make some tweaks, even put a video feature in it, okay. put some, some links in it, um, give it a completely fresh look, and then um, and then publish it again. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't have to completely reinvent the wheel. Right. I think, and a lot of times, or even just just making a blog post longer would be a good way of repurposing it. Um, sure. I, th I think the other thing you could do is you could go the other way, which is to have a, a written blog post and say, I'm going to try to make a video out of this. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about setting your fees in video form um, for 10 minutes and use that outline, um, or even using that and build an online course about it. Right. So, That's, yeah. Great, yeah. great ideas because you know there are some people who pref who prefer to to read blogs and like my wife she hates to watch videos so she would be one of the blog readers but there are people that are just the opposite they would rather have the yeah. visual you know so it's really interesting so you can uh, perhaps get a broader base of people who are exposed to your content and boy that that's really that's really a good idea for private practitioners isn't it. It's it's a neat way to do it, and it and it really speaks to your strengths. If you're not if you don't want to do a video, you're not there yet. It's just not your yeah. thing. Then then maybe you're a good writer. If you're not a great writer, maybe you're good at video or just voice or just podcasting. And um, that's the other thing that I think people are really discovering can can hold a lot of value. Yeah, uh, it's just the spoken word. Well, John, I know you got your start um, out in San Francisco. You had friends, uh, colleagues that picked your brain, and that's kind of how um, this got started. You, you wrote stuff down, you developed it in the blogs, and um, I think this started privatepracticeworkshop.com. But I'm wondering at this point where privatepracticeworkshop.com is at. Um, where are you wanting it to be and what is it all? Why don't you tell us a little bit more about what it's all about? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and I, I think it's, it, as it evolves, I continue to figure out what this is. Okay. At first, <laughs> like I said, it was just a way to continue to help therapists. And, and just like we want to be really helpful with our clients, um, I'm always thinking, how can I be helpful to other therapists? Okay. Um, I started with working with, with therapists locally and helping them, um, uh, branch out and grow their practices and really convert to private pay. But now I'm really um, trying to do a lot more online and grow and grow a bigger audience and um, and automate a lot of the stuff that I'm doing. So the blog post is one way to do that. I've got an online course that's coming out this summer. Um, it's a business basics course. So it's on everything that you need to get started and then how to run your operations. Okay. Um, talk about creating a business plan, uh, which is something that is overlooked a lot. We, sure. we a lot of times just jump into private practice with no plan. And I think that's part of where our anxiety comes from is we don't really have a plan. We don't really have a budget. We're not great at talking about numbers. Um, so I walk, th I walk through um, all those things in a really simple, accessible way that works for therapists, um, mm -hmm. given that I've been through this. I've sat down with someone who asked me to write a business plan. And I know how much anxiety that caused me. Yeah. And so I've, I've just kind of translated things into what I think therapists uh, are going to be more likely to, to kind of jive with. Um, talk a little bit about marketing, setting your fees, doing that, those client phone calls, and then a little bit about accounting as well. Like, just, How do I take money? Exactly. How do I receive it? Where do I put it? Um, how do I know how much to pay myself? It just – it gets all that out of the way to – so that you don't have to be 10 months in your practice and go, am I doing this right? Am I, <laughs> how do other people do this? Where do, where do other people put their receipts? Or, or, just, just or, that. or people who don't even want to take the plunge into private practice to begin yes. with. I, I think there's a lot of fear um, uh, from therapists. You know, they, they, it's so it's so appealing to them to do private practice, but yet they yeah. do not <laughs> want to take the plunge it's too risky or, or, or whatnot. Have you run into that? And, and how do you deal with that? Or how do you help um, therapists kind of move beyond that and actually take the plunge? The first thing I say to every therapist who started from, who ha hasn't done anything yet is private practice is one of the very few businesses, period, well, very few small businesses where you are not going to take out a business loan to start a private practice, mo most likely, right? right. Um, and actually, you tell me if you know, but I, 
I haven't even met a therapist yet who's taken out a business yeah. loan to start their practice. Start on a bootstrap. Yeah, just, yep. We, we're all bootstrapping it. Yep. We're all kind of relying on our partners or on yep. um, a few thousand bucks you have saved. That is a tremendous opportunity in itself. Yeah. That's a no fail, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think the other way that you have to look at it is let, grow with your practice, right? So I've always started small. When I was in San Francisco, I started small. When I came to Charlotte, I started small. And a lot of that has to come down to what are your basic starting expenses and what are your recurring expenses? So for me, that it always comes down to subleasing when I'm in a new place okay. or when I'm not sure how this market is or where my fees should be or how busy I'm going to get. Um, so I'm going to take, for instance, when I came to Charlotte, so I said, okay, I don't know anything about this market. People are actually telling me, therapists were telling me, no one's going to pay out of pocket here. They all use insurance, which I found to be incorrect because ah. – I'm full and I've got, you know, people, I've got a, a psychologist who works with me and getting her full. So there's a lot of mist within that. But also my risk was so low because I sublease an office for $125 for one day a week per okay. month, right? If I can see one client for one hour for $125, yeah. I've, broke, I've broken even, there you right? Go. Yep. No brainer. Um, no brainer to me, right? It's yeah. a no brainer. But I think therapists have to see that you don't have to get an office that's a thousand dollars a month and spend all this money. And you can spend five thousand dollars on a website, or you can spend five hundred, or you can spend two fifty. It just depends on how much you're willing to hustle. There's folks who it, you're in a different situation if you just quit a full time job and you need to make full time money right now. That's a different scenario. Yeah. And if that's the case, I'm, my strategy to help you is going to be a lot different than you've got a full time job or a part time job or um, you don't you don't have to get full right away. So part of it depends on your personal financial situation and how quickly do you need to get full and how much money do you want to make with this thing. All right. Well, the thing that I like what you're describing now is um, you, I've heard you mention the word have a plan, have a plan. Um, and I think that having a plan would probably reduce a lot of that anxiety. But what you're also doing, John, is you're offering a lot of good information. And I think that having information um, will do a lot to dispel a lot of the, the, the myths or the fears that people have about doing things like this. And from what you're saying, um, to me, if I, if I were a person who wanted to go into private practice and were listening to you, I would think, you know what, what John's telling me, I, I think this is doable. I think that I could actually do this now that I have the information. And I think that is part of what you're doing as private practice workshop dot com is trying to provide this kind of information to therapists, aren't you? It's exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to kind of bring down the veil of, um, first of all, like you said, we don't want to overly romanticize private practice that right. I'm, you know, just going to be in this comfortable office, you know, seeing really rich clients and charging them whatever I want. Um, so we can't romanticize it, but we also need to remove the veil of, I'm not ready for private practice. I'm not a business person. I'm not whatever it is. I'm not old enough or I'm not further long, far along enough in my career, whatever it is like the, the myth you've been telling yourself as to why, why not? I do try to help break that down and really be transparent about this is how I've grown my businesses. This is how I've reduced risk. Um, cause I'm pretty risk averse as well. Okay. Um, so I, I, I get it, yeah. but you're right. That that's a big part of what I do with private practice workshop is, is kind of, um, is, is just kind of to, to show people that it's possible and also be realistic about if you do it and if you're ready, if you're going to bootstrap it, be ready to bootstrap it, be ready to work on it a lot now so you can work on it a lot less later. Okay. So, so you really end up front doing a lot of front end work. And I consider, uh, you know, launching a private practice almost a lot like working for a startup or like a, you know, right. a young startup company that hasn't made any money yet. Mm -hmm. Um, that work is very front front end heavy where you're doing a ton of work now so that hopefully it'll pay off and eventually um, you know, you, you'll, you'll end up doing less work for that stuff later once you're established in the community. Once your website's ranking high, um, you don't have to do quite as much as you had to do in the beginning. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I'm a college professor as well as being a private practitioner. And 
what you're talking about is very similar to teaching an online course where there is a lot of upfront work, but boy, it really pays off on the back end. So I think that that's really good advice. Well, John, for people who want to do the private practice, um, there are obviously going to be some challenges involved. And so what are some of those challenges that therapists should expect if they want to start a private practice? I think especially given that if, if you're going to start and run a private pay practice, which is the type of practice that I run and promote and I suggest doing or at least trying, okay. uh, if you're not already on insurance panels, I suggest you know, pretty much no matter where you are, try it private pay, right? Because it's a lot easier to get on panels later than to get on a bunch of panels now and then go, you know what, crap, I think I could actually charge 100 bucks. I could charge 120 or 150 and now it's really hard to get off those panels. You've got a lot of, you know, challenges in front of you to do that. So um, I think, but but getting getting clients is, is, for me, the number one concern and the number one concern that I help therapists with. Okay. Um, it's, yeah, how are people going to find you and how are people going to keep finding you? Mm -hmm. I think, one of the, the challenges within that is that um, most, you know, most, most clients, at least in my experience, they don't necessarily talk about their therapist with another person. Um, so my mom's a realtor, and over 70% of her referrals come from word of mouth, right? Yeah. Someone worked yeah. with her, they had a great experience, they say, hey, yeah. go, go work with Vicki Clark, and that's great. And she doesn't have to generate new original leads nearly as much as we do as therapists. Right. So that's that's really hard, right? Yeah. That people don't walk around going, "Hey, you should go see my therapist," because I think <laughs> there's, there's a weird thing that they think we're going to talk about them and say, "Hey, oh, you're yeah, um, yeah, I worked with Alex. He's yeah, he's pretty messed up, man. You know, uh -huh. yeah." <laughs> <laughs> they're, 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 people don't want to share their therapist. That's right. It's so weird. Yeah. Like he's my, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm. I'm <laughs> So I think that's that's one of the hardest things is just getting those original leads um, over and over again. It's it's tough if you're not on insurance panels. Yeah, I think uh, you know, speaking of insurance, I think over the past several years, what I've noticed because I'm I'm about my practice is probably about half self pay and, and half insurance. But what I've noticed, John, with the insurance over the past several years is that. Uh, for most of my clients, the both both the deductibles and the co-pays, well, well, and the co-insurance, all three of those things have steadily risen, and yes. more of the burden is being placed on the client. And so Absolutely. it's as if the client is pay, is self-pay anyway, in a lot of cases, until the end of the year when they've met the deductible and all that kind of stuff. But it's almost as if they're paying out of pocket anyway. And yes. I think that perhaps that could be something that a therapist who wants to do um, all, all self-pay, pri private pay, could make that kind of an argument or as part of their marketing pitch that, you know what, this is kind of the way things are evolving now. Um, so this is one of the reasons that I'm um, going private pay. Does that does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. When I when I brought on um, the psychologist who works at Charlotte Counseling and Wellness with me, um, we've had to get her off of panels, and we started looking at some of her the co-pays for her clients. And these are even people who have great jobs at big banking industries here in Charlotte, and their copay is eighty dollars. Yeah. Right. The copay is yeah. seventy five or a yeah. hundred dollars or even one twenty at some point. It's like, okay, what is your insurance doing for you after <laughs> all? Um, and then we had to sit there and say, okay, who's to say that um, this person wouldn't just assume pay that, right? And then submit a bill to get reimbursed. Um, right. So I think there's there's definitely a way to do it. I think there's also some markets where um, it's you kind of have to take insurance, right? If you're in a really small town um, or if you don't. If you're not able to make a good case for why you're only private pay, it can be tough. And part of what I help therapists do is make that case. Um, so I think it's it is about how you frame it, and also what you believe in terms of what you are worth and what yeah. therapy is worth. I think a lot of therapists get really hung up on I feel quote unquote I feel bad taking eighty dollars or a hundred dollars or one hundred fifty dollars um, from a client. Even I think 
therapists say things yeah. like take, or, I'm or taking I'm, people's money. I'm a fraud. Yeah. I, you know, I'm not, I don't real. I'm not that competent and I shouldn't yeah. be charging this much and I'm just a fraud. And yeah, it's a lot of that kind of stuff, isn't it? Yeah. And I don't know why we are that way uh -huh. <laughs> or if it's just because we're helpers or because historically we've been really undervalued um, just over time and also undervalued by insurance companies. Who's to say that we shouldn't get reimbursed even half of what my eye doctor gets reimbursed, mm -hmm. which is over $400 for a 45 minute visit. Right. Um, you, yeah. you know, so I think I'm, I'm constantly pushing the envelope with us thinking about more about what we're worth. Cause I think when we convey that to clients, um, and there's actually some good, some academic research coming out about about this. That um, when clients pay for therapy, oftentimes they get better sooner. They're more invested yeah. in therapy, and they maintain right. their gains, right? Because right. you're not going to pay $150 and not do your homework, not really bring yourself to the session. Right. You know, clients are are more. They they show up on time. They cancel less. So there's a lot of benefits there, um, and. I think it actually gives the therapist more room to operate their practice how they want. Mm -hmm. um, th another question is I come from a nonprofit uh, background. I used to do a lot of work in San Francisco in the community and juvenile justice and in the schools. And so part of the dissonance for me at some point was, okay, I'm, I'm spending the day working with folks who are in a really hard place in life or who yeah. do not have means or living in really rough neighborhoods. And then I'm going to this fancy neighborhood and charging 150 right, right. for people who it's no skin off their back. Right. Uh, how do I make sense of that? And eventually in private practice, I realize I can do that. And for the clients that can pay, they'll pay and it's not a big deal. And then actually because it's such a simple transaction, it's such a clean transaction, I can slide more for those that, that, need that lower fee, right. right? So I actually have more time and energy to devote to that. And I know exactly how much I can slide and still maintain that social justice kind of value system that I have. So mm -hmm. um, it, it, it works well for me, but I think every therapist has to make it work for them. And it really, being in private practice, it challenges you to look at what are my values? You know, what do I... It's a good point. Um, yeah. I think I think that I think that's all a process of, of working through that. I know that uh, one of our the therapists on private practice journeys, uh, Lisa Dewey, had talked about this, where she came out of a social work background, which is very heavily social justice oriented, and having to kind of work through that, and that it's okay to be in private practice, it's okay to make money, and some of the things that you were just talking about, John, and so I do think that that's a process. Well, I want to, uh, getting toward the end of our podcast here, I wanted to ask you, kind of getting back to the whole plan idea that's been the theme of this of this podcast, I wonder what are some things that therapists can do today who might have thought or might be thinking about private practice and just what are some concrete steps they can be doing today to kind of move in that direction? Great question. Um, I think one one common mistake that a lot of therapists make, um, even when they're starting to see some success, is that they stop putting money back into their business. Okay. Um, and so I think, you know, look at just because a client pays you hundred dollars doesn't necessarily mean that hundred dollars is all yours. Um, at some point it might be, or if you're you know, running a group practice and everything is covered, you know, through what your other clinicians are bringing in, it might be a different story. But I think for me, you know, looking at, okay, if I make a hundred dollars, I know some part of that, especially in the beginning stages is going right back into the business. Right. Mm -hmm. It's going right back into marketing. It's going into getting a, you know, a, a nice coffee maker for the office, whatever it is, um, that is either going to bring me more leads, more clients or enhance my client experience, like a nicer couch or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so I think, think about it like that, right? That, that um, you, you do have to spend some money to make money, and I don't think we always think about that intuitively, but even putting 100 bucks a month into Google AdWords would be more than the average therapist is doing right now okay. to promote their practice. So mm -hmm. um, figure out what you can spend, you know, talk with someone or see what other therapists are doing or work with a consultant to figure out what that budget is and then and, and build that into to part of your plan. Okay. And then for the therapist who's currently working, let's say, in a community mental health center, 
They've been out of school for three, four years. They've been thinking about, okay, private practice. I think I want to do this. Um, what is one concrete step for that person, for that therapist who's in mental health, who wants to go private practice? What would you, if you were talking to them today, what is one concrete thing that you might have them do to kind of move in that direction? This is going to be, um, this is a little different from what I've talked about so far, because I've talked a lot about using the internet yeah. for, for this situation that you're asking about. I would say, go meet someone Go meet a therapist who's who's successful in private practice in your area, who sees the types the types of clients that you might want to see, and just just get to know them, just pick their brain, figure out what's what it's like for them, what has worked for them, and then at some point, you know, when when I'm network networking with people in my area, um, I I might want to ask, you know, so how do people find you? So you got this great practice, yeah. you're down on Fifth Street. How how do people clients find you? And they and you get a lot of different answers that way. And you get a ton of information as to what works in my area. Um, and then you can ask them questions like how long did it take you to get full or what do you consider full? You know, how many clients do you see a week? Cause maybe they work really part time and you need to be full time. So, um, get a feel for your area and then that's going to dictate, I think what you do next. But again, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. So figure out what is, who's been successful so far and what have they done and um, what can I learn from that person? And that, that's precisely what I did in San Francisco, actually my first, okay. my first practice. And I ended up working with that therapist to get my, my practice started. Ah. Um, so that was a great way to do it. And he wasn't looking to take someone on. He wasn't looking to mentor someone, but I just saw that he was successful and yeah. I, um, I actually tried to make myself useful to him. I, I, after that coffee conversation, he was having a hard time with his Facebook page for his business. And I said, Hey, I don't know a lot about it, but I think I could actually help you with it. I know how to upload that thing. Okay. And I just did it. So I actually took that mentality of service and of being helpful. And I just said, Hey, um, maybe I can help you with that Facebook page. And I'd ask for, for nothing in return. And then a few months later, you know, he, he brought me on and yeah. gave me my start. So. Wonderful. Yeah. So I, I think really what you're recommending here I like because it's killing two birds with one stone by talking to a private practitioner. First, you get the information. And this is what we were talking about before in the podcast where information is the is the sword to, to slay the, the fear dragon that, you know, when you have information, that's really king. But the, the second way I think that it helps is by what you said, networking, that you develop these, these relationships with people in your community and they'll get to know you and maybe they can tell you, hey, I have this other private practitioner colleague, you might want to go talk to them too. And so you start to develop your networks that way. And I, so I love that advice that you're giving there. It's wonderful advice. Ultimately, we are professionals who build relationships with people, right? And yeah. actually, we build relationships with people who are sometimes really hard to build relationships That's right. with. So use those skills um, to, to really to help yourself along the way. Um, and then the other things that maybe don't come as naturally, like marketing or blogging or SEO, you know, get some help with those things or, or um, pay for someone to do those things. And really think about what is it that I'm good at and how can I capitalize on those strengths. And I think, too, uh, adding on to that, John, is just kind of learning what a blog post looks like. If you've never re read one before, go out and read them. Like podcast, you mentioned That's Joe great. Sanok yeah. uh, because Joe's podcast was the first was the first podcast I'd ever listened to many years ago. And mine, too, actually. Yeah. yeah. And yep. wonderful podcast series, Practice of the Practice. And um just listening to his and then listening to others and different styles and just kind of, okay, so this is how you do a podcast. So it's just really exposing yourself to those things just to kind of, as, as the learning process, I think that that helps too. Yeah. Well, John, great. how can therapists contact you if they're interested in working with you? Yeah. Um, the easiest thing to do is just to head over to private practice workshop, uh, com. I've got, um, um, a free marketing guide that I give away in exchange for putting you on my emailing list. So that's an easy way to look at, um, some of the tools that I use to, to market my practice and also okay. how to measure, measure it, how to see if that's actually working. Um, and then there's tons of blog posts. There's a lot of free resources on there as well. Uh, and then I'd love for people to join that Facebook group. That's sure. the community where um, I'm offering a lot of a lot of answers to people's questions, 
Uh, I'm on, I do Facebook live a couple of times a week where I just hop on and have okay. kind of a Q and a, so that's a way that a lot of, and a lot of people are starting to take advantage of that and hop on and have questions ready, um, that I'll answer as best I can, uh, in that, in that group. And then, um, it's just a community and it's just a, a, a place to get help and get your questions answered and to, to be a part of something, knowing that private practice can be a little isolating. Um, you know, the internet provides such a cool way for us to feel uh, more together. Yeah. And I, and I recently joined the community and I appreciate that. And it's a, it's a wonderful community. You've, you got a lot of loyal followers uh, from what I can tell so far. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I encourage people to join that and I'll make sure and put all the links to that in the show notes so people can easily access that. Well, John, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. It was wonderful to learn uh, about your, your story, your journey, um, things that you've done to, to uh, get into private practice and uh, offering all your helpful suggestions to the journey followers. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. This is great. Okay, thanks. All right. Really nice to have John on the podcast episode today to pick his brain about private practice and in particular, looking at these marketing elements and, uh, you know, blogging as an example. I, you know, prior to about a year and a half ago, I really didn't know what a blog was. I'd heard about it a lot, but never really considered considered uh, reading blogs. And uh, at that time, I thought, you know what, I should probably check this out. And, uh, and what I did, I thought to myself, boy, what a great way of helping clients or, or, or potential clients learn about you and, and how you think about things and how you do things. And uh, so I think that that makes total sense. And, uh, you know, other ways of marketing yourself as, as well. So uh, I really appreciate John coming on the podcast today to talk about these things. Um, I want to encourage you to uh, listen to the next couple of weeks of, of, of podcast episodes, because once again, we're going to continue with our guest experts. Uh, we're going to have them talk to our uh, therapist about their practices and what they can do to further enhance their practices. So I encourage you to listen to those upcoming episodes. If you want to get the show notes, by the way, of today's podcast episode with John, please visit my website, chrisquarto.com. That's C-H-R-I-S-Q-U-A-R-T-O.com. And uh, you can also get all the uh, old uh, podcast episodes. If, if you haven't listened to any of these from the beginning of the year, they're all there with all the show notes. And uh, so check them out. I think that you'll really like what you hear. So uh, until next week. Have a great rest of the week.